Last week, I talked about change your mind. And I meant it a little bit tongue in cheek, but also really quite seriously uh, at two levels. Uh, one level is changing the contents of our mind, in particular, uh, opening up to new ideas. Uh, shifting our concept of ourself, letting go of certain rules we have about how we have to be or how other people have to be um, that are binding and limiting and create suffering for ourselves and maybe conflict with others. Um, letting go of assumptions or expectations that are really no longer true, even if they once were true when we were young. Changing our mind and shifting out of what could be called wrong view and being brave enough and big enough to increasingly accommodate to new information in a way in which we budge without being pushed around by other people or jumping from one idea uh, to another, but more um, having a mind that, as the Buddha put it, is malleable so that it is wieldy, so that we can use it for good purposes. And I explored some of the ways in which we can help ourselves to have a mind that is more open and flexible and, and nimble and adaptive. Tonight, I'd like to talk with you about this whole subject of changing, changing the mind at an even deeper level. And I want to remind us all of the ultimate vision that we find in all of the traditions, including secular ones, of the heights of human potential. Uh, I liken those, you know, on the cover of my book because I'm a mountain guy. You know, the idea of there are many paths or many routes toward the top of the mountain of the highest happiness, the wisest, most loving, most courageous, most noble ways a human can be. There are many routes up to the top of that mountain, but as the routes get higher and higher, they converge more and more. And you find similar qualities in people in a Sufi tradition, secular Western mindfulness, Christian practice, Buddhist practice, more and more they kind of converge. And so in the spirit of that invitation of certainly the Buddha, as well as many other great teachers to come along, you know, to come join them, I want to talk about some deepening of personal practice. To be candid, uh, in my own practice, I stumbled on meditation around 1974, and there was an immediate sense that there was something important here, but I didn't really know what I was doing. And I kind of hung out in, I'm going to call it a beginner's stage of practice. I know that might sound judgmental. I mean it in a kind of descriptive way. Yes, beginners can often have advanced flickers or advanced breakthroughs, uh, but they're not yet stable. If you recall the teaching or I'll tell you freshly, from Milarepa, the great Tibetan sage, he was describing his life of practice in which he said uh, three things. In the beginning, nothing came. In the middle, nothing stayed. In the end, nothing, nothing passed. It was fully present. It stayed with him all the way. And so um, uh, in my own practice, I hung out in the beginner stage probably for 20 or 30 years, really, and it was fine. It was relaxing. I meditated. There were insights, but it was okay. And it was only really around, I'd call it probably about 20 years ago, maybe 25 years ago, that I kind of put it into gear and began to engage what could be called a certain seriousness, a certain focus in my own practice. Whatever these words mean, I'll call that a more intermediate stage. And particularly recently, I've become increasingly called to what could be called, I think, uh, you know, frankly, a more advanced kind of practice. And we can get caught up in pitfalls, obviously. We can compare ourselves to others. We can get egoic. We can put too much pressure on ourselves. Yada, yada, yada. I got it. <laughs> there are pitfalls. Don't fall in the pits. While also recognizing, frankly, just kind of where you're at. And so if you're someone who has had a bit of an introduction to mindfulness or meditation, or you've been doing it in a certain kind of way for some years now, but there's a feeling of, you know, I'd like to steepen the growth curve here. I'd like to kick it into gear. I'd like to engage some deeper matters. Then these seven factors of awakening that were laid out for us by the Buddha are really useful to um, have happen 
more in your daily life and to look for ways, even particular occasions like a meditation retreat or going for a walk in the woods or you know, investing um, longer periods of time regularly for meditation or really setting aside uh, an hour every week for some deeper reflection, whatever it might be. These seven factors of awakening are really, really useful, and I'll be talking about them in a moment. And then I want to relate these seven factors of awakening to certain qualities that are implicit in them but are not made very explicit until you start engaging Tibetan and Zen Buddhism when there's more of an emphasis on a radiant heart, the the aspect of love, and also more of an emphasis on spaciousness, the field of abiding as awareness, abiding as simply being. And how might that relate to the original path set out by the Buddha that's captured in the Theravadan teachings? So that's what I want to talk with you about tonight, which is very relevant to personal practice. So as I talk here, keep trying to get a sense of what's that feel like? What would it feel like? What Rick's talking about? How do I already have a sense of that? And how can I deepen in my sense of that here? And then I'll try to move through this fairly briskly so that we have some time for discussion. And I suspect that we'll be exploring these topics for some time. Please take a look into the sidebar in which I've typed in already um, the seven factors of awakening, which I'll go through in a moment. I've also typed in three different ways to engage what the Buddha pointed to as the culmination of practice, really, an engagement with what is unconditioned, what is not subject to arising and passing away, and is therefore a truly reliable basis for the highest happiness. So I've typed those in, I've written those in, and from time to time, maybe some helpful person can copy what I've written and then repost it to everybody. So as we proceed, you have access to what I put into the sidebar. Okay, so awakening. That's the aim, enlightenment, right? Highest happiness that ultimate stainless liberation of mind and heart, the heartwood of practice. That's what the Buddha pointed to, which arises, occurs, proceeds, progresses, we move up the mountain as it were, uh, you know, based on causes and conditions of different kinds. And in this model, notably seven in particular. There are additional ones, but these seven definitely really matter a lot. So let's explore these seven. And you can kind of assess yourself. How strong are you currently? Um, What are you you able to experience, uh, even if it doesn't stay? And what uh, doesn't leave uh, as you get increasingly grounded in a particular factor of awakening? So first, mindfulness. A sustained present moment awareness of the inner and outer world alongside which can be other things, like other factors of awakening, other forms of wise effort in the mind. Uh, Different factors can support mindfulness itself, like training and steadying your attention, uh, developing the will, developing a greater capacity to be with experiences rather than swept away by them. Somebody asked me earlier in the sidebar what I meant by not identifying with a reaction. What I mean by that is the distinction between being angry and having anger or having the thought arise in your mind that you'd really love to run into the rear bumper of this jerk in front of you who's driving like a maniac, but you let that thought pass away. You don't get carried along by it. You separate from it. You disidentify from it. You don't make it mine, my precious. That's what I mean by that. And mindfulness is crucial for that. Mindfulness enables a a fundamental spaciousness of awareness in which thoughts, feelings, desires, and so forth come and go. We're sustaining present moment awareness of them without being hijacked by them or without fighting with them. Mindfulness. Second factor of awakening, and these are described, by the way, in a kind of sequence that sort of emerges over time, but we don't have to get too rigid about the sequence. Second factor of awakening is investigation. This is where I was talking with my wife the other night, my own background in human potential and then in psychotherapy 
has actually been really helpful. Uh, we can kind of, as all things, they have pitfalls. We can get carried away by psychoanalyzing ourselves. But that spirit of investigation and inquiry, oh, what's it like to be you? Oh, what's this experience like? Oh, what caused that reaction? What primed it? What habit of view, like I talked about last week, you know, sort of framed the meaning of what occurred, which then triggered a certain kind of reaction in you? Oh, these are things we can investigate. We can investigate certainly the contents of awareness and what uh, supports feelings and thoughts and desires moving through awareness that create suffering. And we can also investigate and become more knowledgeable about those factors within us that are conducive to happiness and welfare for ourselves and other people. By the way, these factors of awakening are directed at our own mental processes, our own psychology. It's not because external conditions don't matter. Often it's actually quite helpful to do what we can in realistic ways for other people and for ourselves to intervene in the world so that we've kind of cleared the decks enough, at least, uh, of the alarm bells banging on us uh, or ringing loudly in our ears so we can actually do some inner practice. That said, the focus here is on inner practice, including the inner practice of investigation. So you might ask yourself, how self-aware are you of your own depths? How uh, much have you explored, really, your own interior? If your mind is like a mansion with many rooms, have you opened the doors, including in the basement, to all that might be there? Have you been able to do that? And if not, that's full of opportunity. Uh, how uh, able are you in real time, really close to the arising of experience within seconds, to be aware of and to be able to identify and, and investigate what is causing you to react in the ways that you are? If not, that's a field of opportunity. And also with investigation, even more fundamentally, we can in investigate and we can recognize not just the contents in the stream of consciousness, but the nature of those contents, the nature of all experiences as impermanent, made of parts that arise based on causes of various kinds so that all experiences and most worldly conditions as well are empty in the technical sense of essence, of ownership, of absolute self-causing identity. And that sense of our experiences as foamy, cloud-like, uh, fuzzy, gauzy, <laughs> you know, porous, thread-like, you know, entanglements of experience rather than knotted, brick-like things that burden us and that we try to possess and manipulate as we relate to our experiences increasingly as sort of fuzzy, empty, existent, cloud-like processes, we tend to lighten up and not feel so burdened by things. And that insight, vipassana, in the word Pali, is penetrating and freeing as we gradually recognize the nature of all experiences. We feel less burdened by them. We feel freer in our relationship to them. Investigation. So you might ask yourself, what are your investigations like? And are you drawing on teachings of various people? Um, the Buddha, things I've written maybe, things other people have written or said, other traditions, to aid in your investigations. I'm reading a wonderful book right now called Seeing That Freeze, which is very much about the real-time recognition of the emptiness of experiences from Rob Burbay. And also, I recently read a, another amazing book, One Blade of Grass, by the Zen teacher uh, Henry Shukman. Incredible book, beautifully written, deeply heart-touching. And you know, for me, it's been personally transformative. One Blade of Grass, wonderful, wonderful book. So these books or writings or teachings or conversations or other kinds of things, including, for example, psychotherapy, um, can actually aid in our investigations. Um, OK. then. Third, energy. We need to bring energy to bear. You know, if we don't have much energy for practice, if it's kind of la di da, whatever, you know, whatever, well, you know, we're not going to probably progress very far up that mountain of awakening. 
It takes energy to shift old habits. Now, the brain has a negativity bias. It tends to hold on to old neurotic patterns, especially ones that happened when we were young, and especially ones that happened when we were young involving other people. So we got to bring some energy to bear. Do you have an energy for practice? Uh, do you call yourself to practice? Even if you're tired, um, is there the energy of determination? Even if you're tired, um, is there a, an internal sense of a kind of undefeatable longing or aspiration, at least to take the next step to, that, that feels right to you in your own practice? Energy. And then it also certainly helps to think about conditions that foster energy. Uh, meditating just before you go to sleep when you're exhausted, mm, I don't know so much. Uh, maybe it's helpful to do it earlier in the morning. Maybe <laughs> A lot of people on retreat, me included, are mainlining coffee in the morning or green tea, whatever floats the mental boat. Um, you know, things that foster your energy. But in particular, you know, is there zeal? Are you ardent? Is, is there a fire in your heart for practice, energy? With energy, with investigation, with mindfulness can come bliss. And this is very interesting that uh, the Pali word piti, variously translated as rapture or bliss, is one of the factors of awakening. And related to the sense of rapture can be certainly happiness, joy, uh, you know, positive emotions of various kinds. It's important for our practice to be juicy. It's important for it to, to um, in fact, be potentially intensely joyful and pleasant and luscious. And in that lusciousness, not that we're getting attached to it, um, but in that lusciousness, there's a cleansing of the mind and a motivation for practice. And when you start having experiences of this rapture, this bliss, this joy, it's very motivating. You suddenly realize, as I have on retreat at different times, whoa, this is the real deal. <laughs> You're not in Kansas any longer. <laughs> this is different, not as something to cling to, but you realize, wow, this is a beautiful happiness. The Buddha said, this happiness is supportive of awakening, this kind of happiness. Um, it's not to be shunned. We should not push it, push it away out of some kind of ascetic zealotry. We should open to this kind of happiness because it's one of the engines, it's one of the factors that will carry us along. I'm seeing questions coming in, um, you know, and I may be able to speak to them later. I'll just say right now, uh, there are different ways that these lists are organized. This is for uh, Noosh. Um, they're all important. Arguably, to be able to do any of them, we need to be mindful. So maybe that's really foundational for the rest. But the other factors support mindfulness too. Um, the book I mentioned, the two books first from Rob Burbay. Um, seeing that freeze, uh, and then One Blade of Grass by Henry Shookman. Either or both, I think, will really, really be useful for you. They're very oriented to practice. Okay, so to continue, all right? How are you doing so far? So mindful, you are mindful. You are investigating with energy and opening to and even welcoming and uh, receiving uh, emotionally positive states of being, including ones that start to feel very intense. As the bliss kind of eases and passes, tranquility is another factor of awakening. And in the meditation tonight, I talked about tranquility and easing in the body, a quieting of the mind, a settling down, um, this is something that we gradually can train in, so we start more rapidly being able to kind of disengage from and recover from the busyness of the day and, and rest more in a sense of tranquility. Um, the mind can start to become very quiet, nonverbal non activity starts quieting, especially as we heighten the sense of bodily sensations and open into spaciousness, which tends to quiet neurologically. Um, internal verbal activity, we become increasingly tranquil. We're less and less troubled by reactive patterns of emotion. We're less and less carried along by the feeling of drivenness. 
even in the midst of being active and getting a lot of stuff done in a day, being really productive, at the heart of it all, as tranquility develops as a trait in you, there's an inner peace. There's an inner quiet at the center of. There's a stillness at the center of daily activity, tranquility. As tranquility really develops, we start moving into concentration, including in the non-ordinary states of awareness marked in the wise concentration pillar, the, one of the eight elements of the Eightfold Path in Buddhism, these non-ordinary um, states of consciousness called the jhanas. These are traditionally known in the meditative traditions of northern India, states of being, that become progressively subtle in, and in which consciousness becomes increasingly refined. Most people are not able to access the jhanas for real and you know, just kind of casual daily practice at home, uh, but on retreat. A week-long retreat, especially perhaps longer retreats, especially with teachers that are really aiming for these experiences, these are accessible for people. And these days, increasingly, there are teachers like Lee Brasington, Tina Rasmussen, Stephen Snyder, uh, Shala Catherine, Richard Shankman, and others, uh, Michael Taft, Shinzen Young, and others who really are there to help people, guide people in these um traditionally recognized states of consciousness that involve deep concentration. You know, deep concentration, both in terms of steadiness of mind and a kind of purification, like concentrating a sauce. There's a concentration of tranquility, a concentration of bliss, a concentration of mindfulness and investigation, and a kind of energy that's, that's contained and extremely fertile and productive. And, and eventually this concentration can ripen further and further into even more subtle states of being uh, that are described as formless realms. Concentration. I do recommend that people really explore concentration. My own practice ignited when I um, started taking concentration seriously. Uh, and which for many people, for most people, will probably involve some kind of sustained period of practice, minimally a day, uh, if not a week or so on retreat, if not longer, with teachers who really know what they're about. And then last, the seventh factor of awakening is equanimity. Profound emotional balance and disenchantment from the stream of consciousness, not um, looking down on it, just not enchanted by it, not carried along by it, and enormous fundamental non-reactivity to both external events and internal experiences. If tranquility is the absence of reactive experiences, equanimity is the absence of reactivity to any experiences in the core of your being. In my view, equanimity for biological creatures such as ourselves uh, is partially uh, supported uh, by uh, developing internal psychological resources that help us to have a felt sense of needs met enough, at least. It's hard to be equanimous when there's a fundamental penetrating sense that your need for safety or satisfaction or connection is not sufficiently met in the present. And so as we grow psychological strengths and skills and capabilities and know-how inside ourselves, we become more able to, to manage our needs effectively in, in important ways. And as we have experiences of needs met enough in the moment, no unmet need in the moment, in the present, as we internalize the sense of peacefulness and contentment and love that happens as we experience needs met enough in the moment, we gradually hardwire that sense into ourselves so that we rest increasingly in it unconditionally, no matter what's happening around us. That's, that's a major um, support for, for equanimity. So these are the seven factors of awakening. And you might ask yourself, huh, what calls to you in that list as something that your inner wisdom tells you, yeah, that would be skillful, that would be helpful if I develop that a little more these days. Greater mindfulness, greater investigation, more energy, more opening to happiness, 
happiness in practice, even blissful happiness, um, tranquility, uh, just a luscious deep sense of stillness and quiet. Oh, laying those burdens down, Whew, dropping that load, not numbing out. Your mind is bright and clear while being extremely quiet and very tranquil, like an undisturbed surface of a beautiful, tranquil mountain pond. Tranquility also supporting deeper meditative practice through concentration and taking back home or taking off the cushion the lessons of that concentration, leading to a growing sense of equanimity. So this is solid dharma. This is fundamental dharma. And I encourage you to take it on board and to ask yourself, okay, what would be really useful to bring more into my own life these days? Now, I want to also relate these classic seven factors of awakening to a couple of things that may seem like they're missing. First is love. There's nothing in there that's explicit about love, compassion, kindness. Um, there's a lot about love, compassion, kindness, um, and moral action in support of others elsewhere in Buddha, the, the early teachings of the Buddha, but not a lot that's explicit here. And that's where I think in part the Mahayana tradition in Tibet and China and Japan and onward um, has been really helpful to foreground uh, the centrality of, of, a, of a noble heart, a loving heart, an open heart, a generous heart, and the transformative, the awakening, potency of, of love. Um, not a love that drains us, not what's called pathological altruism, but we know. We know the ways in which giving ourselves over increasingly to love love flowing out, and even love flowing in as we experience feeling cared about ourselves. That is very important for practice. The other element that's not explicitly described particularly in these seven factors is the element of what is unconditioned, what is undisturbable inherently, what is spacious, what is vast, what is open, you know, what is the ground. And you find this, these themes, uh, emphasized increasingly by Western teachers, you find them emphasized certainly within Tibetan Buddhism um, and certainly within Zen. And I want to talk a bit about them now in terms of three ways of practicing with that which could be unconditioned, thus undisturbed, unchanging. As I listed in the notes in the sidebar, the first way to engage spaciousness is by disengaging from conditioned, habitual, learned, reactive habits of mind. We increasingly step back from them. We disidentify from them. We're less and less caught up in them through investigation. Uh, we increasingly see, hmm, you know, like this is not going to end well. You know, we increasingly recognize the front, the leading edge of our reactions. And even if they seem appealing and energizing and we know this is not going to end well. Okay, so we disengage from those and we increasingly practice in what we explored in the meditation, a resting in what is effectively unconditioned. Awareness is conditioned in the sense of ordinary awareness as a property, biological property of creatures with a sufficiently complex nervous system, like us. Corals are aware of things. Our cat is certainly aware of things. We're aware of things. But awareness itself is an open field that can represent anything. So it's like a blank piece of paper that is not, it, it's available for any kind of thought or reaction or desire or wish or plan to move through it, but awareness itself is an open field. The sense of spaciousness, the sense of possibility, the sense of not knowing. You can feel immediately, as soon as I start talking about them, vastness, space, the space in which things happen, a field of being, not being a being, not being a, a one or a self who bees, but just simply being as a ground, being. 
as soon as I start talking about this, the sense of possibility always just prior to the, pre to the, to the emergent moment that is determined. Feel the possibility. The spirit of not knowing. I think Suzuki Roshi put it, um, in the beginner's mind are many possibilities. In the expert's mind are only a few. There's certainly a place for expertise and many with many regards, but a spirit of not knowing, of don't know mind, of willingness to be surprised, disengaging from expectations, don't know. Oof. It becomes a field of effectively unconditioned possibility. So that's the first of three ways, I think, to productively practice with um, this funny word that comes to us from the Buddha that he banged on again and again and again, variously translated as unconditioned, unfabricated, not uh, subject to passing away, not um, stainless, deathless, uh, the ultimate refuge. What in the world was he talking about? So I think the, what I'm saying here is the first of three ways is your practice deepens and kind of moves through the intermediate stages of practice, even into what's advanced, you know, and we can start doing these practices early on from the beginning, such as resting in awareness, abiding as awareness. Uh, we we disengage from what's conditioned and we rest in what's conditioned, what's unconditioned, effectively. Second way to understand unconditioned is in terms of having extraordinary states of being in which all ordinary experiences, ordinary conditioned experiences cease. Understood within ordinary reality as something that happens in a brain. It's a profound, non-dual experience within ordinary reality, nothing transcendental involved, in which all ordinary conditioned experiences cease. The word is cessation, then in which there's an entry into nirvana. And then on the return, there's a growing recognition, recognition as the circuits start coming back online of the constructed, mechanical, ownerless, distributed, utterly dependent process of the mind. And in that observing, in the return from cessation and nirvana, there's a profound liberation from those ordinary mechanistic processes and a, and a fundamental disidentification from them and a freedom in relationship with them that can be very enlightening. All of which can be understood as a natural phenomenon, a remarkable one, an uncommon one, but just that, no God involved. Then, potentially, there's a third way to understand unconditioned, unconditionality as referring to something which is transcendentally unconditioned meaningfully distinct from the Big Bang conditioned universe. That's a very deep topic. If people want to stop at the first two ways to relate to the unconditioned, as some of my teachers, like Lee Brasington or Stephen Batchelor, um, do, fine, fine. And for those, like me, who have an intuition that there is something, something or other, that is um, meaningfully distinct from the conditioned Big Bang universe, and perhaps which the Buddha and perhaps many other saints and sages throughout history and in the present day are pointing to and affirming, you know, I want to honor that, that possibility as well. And to bring it home then in terms of regular practice, being aware, first of all, is there a growing edge for you in one of these seven factors of awakening? For many people, it is deepening in bliss and tranquility. That's a kind of turning point. Mindfulness, investigation, energy, pretty within reach very early on. To move more into knowing what deep blissfulness and intensity of delight in practice and a, an enormous stillness and quiet in terms of tranquility in your mind, knowing what that's like, having more of a sense of that, 
or training in, in being able to establish yourself more and more in that, even at will in everyday life, that can be a real turning point that then opens up the other factors of awakening, of concentration, and a profound equanimity. So think about that. Second, in terms of these ways of relating to unconditioned or unconditionality, the recognition of spaciousness, the awareness of space, an awareness of being in which doing is occurring. As soon as you start thinking about that sense of spaciousness or space or being in which experiences flow, then you're no longer in it. That's okay. Increasingly, though, with practice, you start disengaging even from thinking about it, and you just rest increasingly spaciously. And you find your own words. I'm just using lots of different words um, to kind of point you in this direction. Okay? Identifying a, a key or two, one or two factors of awakening you want to focus on, and also exploring the aspect of spaciousness. And as your meditation deepens, um, disengaging from doing and you know, making efforts and kind of plopping increasingly open into and trusting more and more simply being. And in this way, in this way, uh, as I began, uh, you will know the mind, shape the mind, and ultimately free the mind as well. And fulfill the promise of the invitation of the great teachers, you know, many uh, known, many not known, to hang out with them increasingly, higher and higher up your own personal path of awakening. Okay. All right. Pretty hardcore, huh? All right. Questions, comments? Um, Lots of questions, <laughs> lots of comments. I see you're waving there, Peter. I'll get to you. I'm going to definitely swing back to you. You're first in line. You're head of the queue here. Uh, I wanted to see what else is here. Um, okay. So you're, I'm seeing wonderful comments from other people in the sidebar about resources of different kinds. You might want to um, take, a, take a look at that. In terms of jhana teachers uh, that I personally know and respect, um, I'll just list a number. Lee Brasington, uh, Shyla Catherine, many of these people have books, Tina Rasmussen, Stephen Snyder, uh, Richard Shankman, Michael Taft, Shinzen Young. Uh, those are ones that I'm quite aware of in the kind of Vipassana or Theravadan dimension of Buddhist practice. Um, then the difference between bliss and joy, kind of a technical question. Uh, bliss is pretty intense, but I think it's important to include under that, you know, that, or at least the near friend, the close companion of bliss, are just simple feelings of, of well-being and contentment and gladness, you know, a gladdening of the heart. I want to, you know, add those qualities in that don't have the kind of, frankly, in the ultimate, almost orgasmic quality in the body of blissfulness that can be really just, wow, almost overwhelming as you're sitting there meditating on retreat. Um, you know, it's not so easy for many people to experience that. But that sense of gladness and joyfulness in practice, the sweetness of happiness, um, you know, this like the, the, the goodness, the lusciousness, the yumminess. <laughs> I don't know what the Pali word for yumminess is. That's a factor. That's skillful means. Happiness is skillful means. And so that's what I'm, I'm calling out here. Okay. Um, Nancy makes a really interesting point about equanimity. This is, I think, um, where she says, I can't help but question if equanimity is possible or even desired if it truly means absence of reactivity. I'm not sure I aspire to that absence. It's a real interesting question. What do we mean by reactivity? And can people who have a lot of equanimity, like I think the Dalai Lama, Thich Nhat Hanh, um, other people, uh, Tara Brock has a lot of equanimity and they can be really feisty sometimes. <laughs> you know, they can be really fiery or so sorrowful or just morally appalled at injustice. That flows through, but the core of being they would describe 
is fundamentally peaceful. I, I liken it to equanimity is sort of the sense of in the core of your being abiding, you know, kind of under the surface of the pond of consciousness. Uh, you're still wakeful there, but you're not disturbed based on the winds that are ruffling the surface. And um, with a, equanimity, we care. We care. We're motivated by love and by compassion, by, by moral virtue, while at the same time, frankly, in the center of our being, we are undisturbed. And um, you can decide if that's if that feels like a good aspiration for you. And what really is helpful in terms of these higher stages of practice is to keep focusing on the next step. You know, the real judgment is, you know, does the next step make sense to you? And does this seem like a path that you're interested in pursuing, at least for the next few steps, even ones that are not yet in reach? But you can trust people further along in the path. It seems to make sense to you, focusing on the next step. And you know, compl complex questions, theological questions, intellectual questions about higher reaches of practice, the meanings of different words, what if, what about, stuff like that. And I, I'm not saying that that's what Nancy's saying here. I'm just bringing it up in general. I, I find that that's not so helpful. What's really helpful, much as it with rock climbing, is to focus on your movement to the next hold. And then as you stabilize there, it usually brings new things in reach. Okay. So Peter, as I've promised, I'm going to ask you to unmute and hear what you have to say here. Okay. Wonderful talk. Um, it was interesting. I hadn't heard you talk so much about higher states, less that sort of thing, energy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I find it really helpful because motivation is a really difficult factor for me. Mm. I have some, you know, a sleep disorder and I have like a chronic fatigue where willpower, you know, yeah. uh, delayed gratification, all of that just goes out the window yeah. and ability uh, and distractibility, you know, sort of yeah. staring into space, that kind of thing. Yeah. What I've been doing, uh, something that, and so, I'm, I'm going to try to make this a question rather than just yeah, definitely uh, describing kind of succinct. Me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll, let me just take a moment then. Catalytic for me has been, I don't know if you know Christy Nelson's work at all, uh, gratefulness. Um, okay. She had cancer. Mm. She didn't know whether she'd live another day or two or whatever, and decided to take complete advantage of every single moment. Yeah. That gives me energy mm -hmm. and it basically uh, uh, an awareness of my mortality and helps me to then, uh, and then one of the things she says is, it's never too late, it's never too early, say yes to your life. Um, so I use the word yes, and that helps. I often do, I don't have the energy, the energy that you're talking about, it just isn't there. Yeah. And so the, what I'm always reaching for is what will give me energy. Right. And um, so I'm not sure what to do there. I mean, what- Can, when, I, can I comment I say, then on what you've said so far? Yeah. Yeah. Um, first off, just flat out, I feel for you. I mean, we it's tough sometimes. We get undermined by our body. We have different conditions. Um, we also sometimes have life circumstances that are invasive and must be dealt with, you know, the care of a child, uh, an aging parent, a crazy job, you know, it's real. Uh, I think that your intuition that draws you to rewarding experiences, juicy, um, you know, emotionally positive experience, yeah, pleasure, you know, pleasurable experiences, frankly, um, is wonderfully, intuitively wise on your part, such as gratitude. And um, if I were to make a little suggestion from what you're saying here, um, it is to practice for briefer, in a formal way, formal meditative practice, briefer periods, just a minute. And just, for example, and in that minute, focus first on releasing, you know, like letting go of tension, letting go of worry, 
you know, letting go of things that hinder you, that hold you down. Um, they're classic hindrances in Buddhism. I'll talk about them in future presentations. But letting go, I just, you know, you've been through a lot, man. Right? It's real. It's real. And uh, that's a, that right there frees energy. Just that, uh, even the physical gesture of that as a practice, uh, letting it go. And then after half a minute of that, a minute of that, you know, turning toward what feels good in the moment, what feels better, an easing, a tranquility, a gratitude, um, a lovingness. I can feel your warmth, you know, your personal warmth, that warm heartedness, right? Just that quality, just turning to it and then giving yourself over to it so that this is a really key point. It doesn't take effort anymore to remain rested in it. It's it's luscious, it's sweet, it feels good, and that naturally carries you along. Um, that is what I've been doing. Great. And that is what, when I say yes to my life, what I mean is yeah, absolutely, it's yes to this moment. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's like, everything is okay. The fact yeah. that I don't have energy, the fact that I don't wanna make an effort, yeah. all of it is just there that's and great. it's okay. Yeah. And then the body relaxes instantly and yeah. I do start to get the pleasure. I have to, there's a little nattering voices of you're being lazy, but that's just part of it. No, uh, giving yourself over um, to the, the bliss factor, if you think of it, they're kind of like four experiences to note. I'll just say this, then I'll talk with Rick Kruger here as a hand up, and then we'll just wrap up tonight. Um, first, it, it can be, you know, there can be a sense of a pleasure in the body that can feel a little rapturous or blissful, even if it's not the full zap that you might get, you know, on day four on a meditation retreat, but it's real. Okay. There is also a certain fundamental happiness. I think gratitude is an example of that kind of happiness. There's a certain happiness we may be, it's even helpful in meditation. Think about things that bring happiness to you, make you smile. Places, Tuolumne Meadows for me, my kids make me happy, laughing at some crazy thing our cat has done recently, just, you know, happiness. And then, so now I've moved from bliss to a kind of dialing it down a little bit, subtler happiness, and then even subtler and more easeful contentment. A sense in the moment of nothing missing, nothing wrong in the present. Contentment. That's nice. And then contentment can even give way to tranquility. So you can mark these four, bliss, happiness, contentment, tranquility, and you can take any single one of them as an object of meditation. You can meditate on happiness so that you become increasingly absorbed in happiness as you absorb happiness into yourself. And then that can soften increasingly and become contentment. And, and then your mind wanders, you come back to contentment, not a bad meditation object, a lot uh, more rewarding and a lot more engaging in terms of attention than just following the sensations of breathing. And then even tranquility, making tranquility, an inner stillness, an inner quiet, uh, not a numbing, you know, your mind is still bright, still alert, but increasingly tranquil. That that's a very useful meditative process, uh, and things and a, and a kind of process and a practice we can certainly do at home in regular practice. Okay, uh, that okay, Peter? Thank you very much. Yeah, wishing you well here with all that. All right, so I'm going to mute you, unmute Rick, and then talk a little bit, and then we'll finish formally. And those who want to stick around can come into breakout rooms. Okay, so Rick, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Great. Yes, I am. Well, first of all, I want to thank you. Um, I was trying to thank you in the chat. It's oh, you have in the past as well, Rick. And I, I've read all your, yeah, I know Rick from our in-person sitting group, a really good guy. And so I just wanted to say thank you, thank you, thank you <laughs> for all the times. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you for the previous times. Um, so tonight, so, so first of all, I, I just want to thank you for, you know, tonight's meditation but all the other ones but but my experience tonight was with this deeper awareness i guess that i began be really began to feel 
in a, in a somewhat different way, I also felt my heart opening, um, <laughs> which is a good thing because it's been pretty closed recently. Yeah. And uh, I'm just wondering, what's the, what is the connection between, um, you know, equ well, not equanimity, because that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's really out of the realm of possibility for me, at least in the moment. But um, you can have moments of equanimity. Yeah. 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 You can have moments of bliss, that. moments of, yeah, uh, that they're, they're not yet stable, but for sure. Okay, go on. Mm. Yeah. But this, but you're talking about a greater sense of happiness, a uh, greater sense of tranquility, and in a place of non reactivity. Yeah. And a place of vulnerability. And, and I think all of those things for me kind of can, um, can foster love um, yeah. of myself, you know, which is kind of a, is a reasonably good place to start. <laughs> yeah. And, and once I begin to feel that this, my ability to actually love others really becomes much, much more accessible. And so I'm just wondering what, is there a connection? <laughs> oh yeah. I think what's all, I'll comment briefly and then I'll finish. Yeah. So first I think you're naming really articulately something that people observe, which is that to use a certain language, when we remove the obscurations, in other words, when our body kind of feels more centered, we get a little quieter, you know, there's more of a sense of spaciousness, just what you're describing, the kind of clutter and irrit irritations and resentments that obscure the naturally warm heart get cleared away. And it doesn't happen as a guarantee. I mean, there are many unfortunate examples of people who are, you know, living the good life in Cancun and are raving assholes, <laughs> nonetheless, right? Uh, unfortunately. But, um, you know, on the whole, for most people, as their mind becomes less cluttered, as they calm, as they feel more centered, you know, a, a fundamental compassion and kindness that's actually inherent to them becomes less filtered, less obscured and can shine forth more readily. Neurologically, there are ways in which uh, I think it's true that as the body becomes more settled and less jacked up with sympathetic nervous system activation, stressful fight flight, you know, reactivity or extremes of parasympathetic activation and freezing, as that kind of naturally starts to happen, um, that supports heartfelt engagement with the world you know, so that, you know, they support each other. And it's also true that we can start the other way. And you might explore. Yeah, I was going to ask them. about that. Yeah, <laughs> you start with because the heart. Because love is a verb. I've heard yeah, you start with the heart and then that, <laughs> that opens us up in the inner peace. Uh, for myself, uh, to finish, I um, <clears throat> have gotten a lot of value from taking as an object of meditation for a lot of a sit. Like I'll do this for a while and kind of... Um, flavor the soup of consciousness, and then I'll let go of active efforts and open out kind of increasingly into everything. But I'll take as an object of meditation the kind of blended sense of an, an open-hearted, contented peacefulness. And you'll notice in that I'm weaving together, you know, the three needs and the green zone of peace, contentment, love, a kind of open-hearted, you know, contented, peacefulness as the object of meditation, as what I'm trying to remain in touch with and become increasingly absorbed in as it becomes absorbed in me. And one can really get serious about that state of being, you know, open-hearted, contented peacefulness, or you can play with the words, you know, a peacefully loving heart, you know, contented, peaceful love, you know, whatever. I like open-hearted, contented peacefulness. Anyway, you can really, really, really marinate in that uh, in a very, very powerful way. I wanted to say just last that um, reactions, as you can observe directly, reactions of various kinds flow through a field that itself is not reactive. You know, awareness is not reactive. Reactions pass through unreactive awareness. And as we increasingly identify with or, or abide as, to put it more 
accurately is we increasingly abide as awareness, as spaciousness, as not knowing, as possibility, as, you know, stillness. As we abide as that, uh, we are increasingly disengaged and untroubled by reactions passing through. Thoughts pass through, reactions pass through, fantasies of vengeance pass through our mind. And we're the, we're the undisturbed field through which disturbing thoughts and emotions pass. And that makes an extraordinary difference in, in how you are. And then becoming increasingly able to return to that sense, including when the oatmeal is starting to fly. That's good practice. Okay, I better wrap up. I better wrap up. How about we just sort of take a moment here and let it all kind of sink in. Um, just a moment. You know, whatever this might be for you, is there a particular factor of awakening? Are you, are you called to deepening your practice? No pressure. Just like a call. And would it serve you to focus more on what is undisturbed? Spaciousness, awareness, not knowing, possibility, stillness. And knowing that this underlying being, the process of being, is of course our true nature. It's always the case, it must be the case underneath it all. And we are in effect falling back into and trusting and being carried by and lived by our already true nature. And just knowing that you know, is very reassuring. Thank you. Thank you very much for your practice and your attention tonight.